So I saw a couple of deck lists in some tournaments that had good results, and I wanted to test them out. I took a look at the results from three tournaments, and two decks caught my eye. The first deck was an Amethyst Steel Control deck that won twice in the first three tournaments. So I knew I definitely wanted to test with that deck. The other deck I looked at didn't win, but plays pretty well in the tournaments. But more importantly, it's my current most played deck, so I wanted to see how it performed in the matchup. I'm talking about Emerald Amber Aggro. I'll link both of the deck lists in the description so you guys can try them out for yourselves. For this video, both my friend and I recorded our screens, so you guys will have the point of view from both decks. I'll commentate for both players about how I think both decks should play. Let's get right into it. So we're going first as green yellow aggro, which is pretty huge. Our perfect starting hand would be Lilo into Simba, although Lilo into Flynn Rider is also very good. When deciding to mulligan, I like to look at my 1, 2, and 3 drop curve, and I'll aggressively mulligan to try and get that starting set up. For this starting hand, we have a Lilo, and we'll keep the Duke of Wesselton probably as our first ink. Unfortunately for us, we mulligan into two high drop Maximuses, and we're still lacking a two drop. So that's pretty unlucky for us. But we do have a turn one Lilo going first, so really can't complain that much. Going to our opponent's point of view, I haven't really played his deck, but I assume he wants to try and get some early one drop Captain Hooks or some Brooms or Prince Eric's to hold off our aggression early on and survive. Rafiki is pretty decent and so is Smash. I'd probably have kept those two cards and dumped everything else. Um, it looks like my opponent also chose to keep a Maleficent which I think is a bit too slow and possibly greedy. Uh, he really wants to increase his chance of mulliganing into a 1 or 2 ink drop creature with his starting hand. Uh, he mulligans and doesn't see any 1 or 2 drops, so his hand is actually pretty terrible for this matchup, and he's going to have a very rough time uh, staving off my early attacks. First turn, I go ahead and ink a Maximus for a Lilo. I think I should have just inked be our guest instead as that card is basically always going to be inked until late game when you draw it and just need to try and draw into a creature. Uh, I have no other play and I pass my turn. My opponent again has a very bad starting hand and he's going second and doesn't draw into a 1 or 2 drop. Here I think inking the queen and passing is probably good as the queen will probably be too slow during this game, especially facing a turn 1 Lilo. On my turn we pick up a big stitch, but we don't have a 2 drop. We quest with Lilo, then we go ahead and ink our big stitch, although I should have inked our beer guest, I'm not sure why I did that. And I drop a Duke of Wesselton, seeing that our opponent didn't have a turn one play. So we want to be very aggressive in picking up any quest points. Then we pass to our opponent. Our opponent continues to run bad as he draws a Jafar. And here I think I'd just ink the Jafar or Maleficent. His turn three should probably be Rafiki to get rid of one of my characters into a turn 4 Tinkerbell, into a turn 5 Shifted Tinkerbell to try and stabilize the board. I don't think he'll really have time to play Jafar if he sets up for this, so he gets rid of big Tinkerbell, which I think is a pretty important card for controlling my characters. And then he passes turn. On my turn, I have a very straightforward play of inking my Duke into a Cheshire Cat after questing. Uh, turn 4 Hans into a turn 5 Maximus should pretty much seal the game if my opponent can't find answers to this board. 
My opponent draws a second friends on the other side, which I think he can ink if he wants to. I think his best play this turn would be uh, Rafiki getting rid of my Lilo with the plan to get rid of my Cheshire Cat next turn. He does end up doing this and then passing the turn back to me. My turn, it's very straightforward again. Quest for three and play Hans after inking Be Our Guest. Green Yellow is a pretty straightforward deck for the most part. Uh, just play aggressive and quest. And then I pass to my opponent. My opponent draws an Elsa, which I'm not even sure he'll survive that long to play her. I guess we'll see. I think he needs to get rid of my characters to slow down my quest points. And so he gets rid of my Cheshire Cat with his Rafiki and smashes my Hans, which I think is the best play for this turn. He goes and inks the Tinkerbell, which is probably fine. On my turn, I draw a Tinkerbell, and though I could ink and Maximus at 5 ink, I don't see any reason to given that the horse only quests for one lore, while Hans puts a ton of pressure questing for 3. So I drop Hans again, and I don't ink this turn and pass to my opponent after questing. My opponent draws Beast, and he really needs to play Rafiki this turn so he can get rid of my Duke and then my Hans the turn after. He could go ahead and ink either Beast or Jafar. I think they're pretty similar. On my turn, again, I have a very simple turn. I quest with Hans. I can see that he's gonna try and trade his Rafiki for my Hans on his next turn, so I just ink my Cheshire Cat and play my Maximus in Bodyguard mode to protect my Hans. I pass again to my opponent. My opponent draws a Grab Your Sword, which is a pretty good card against my deck, but it's not that useful in this situation. Since he can use up to 6 ink this turn, I think his best play would be to try and draw a smash for Hans, since his deck runs 4 copies, although he already used one earlier. He could trade his Rafiki and grab your sword to get rid of Maximus, but he wouldn't have any other play after that, and Hans would just be coming in for another 3 quest points. And then my opponent also wouldn't even have a character on the board after that trade. I think his only hope really is to draw into a smash using friends on the other side. He should also sing the card using Rafiki in case he also draws into Big Tinkerbell, which could clear the board next turn in combination with Grab Your Sword. Luckily for me, he draws a Tinkerbell and a Broom, which doesn't help him out. He ends up deciding to play Jafar. But I think the better play would be to play Maleficent to again give himself a chance to draw a smash. And if he doesn't draw it, I'd play small Tinkerbell with the remaining 3 ink in hopes of shifting into a large Tinkerbell the turn after for board control. That play would actually allow him to remove both my Maximus and Hans since shifted characters can attack or exert abilities as long as the characters they are shifting from could as well that turn. On my turn, I finally have a bit of a decision on what I want to do. His Jafar play is still not bad as he's planning to get rid of my Maximus with his Jafar and then trade his Rafiki for my Hans. So I could quest and get up to 16 lore, but I would end up losing both my characters after that. Alternatively, I could get rid of his Rafiki with my Maximus and get to 15 lore points while protecting my Hans. And knowing my opponent definitely doesn't have a smash in hand, since he would have played it last turn, I could cast my Tinkerbell and have the win on board next turn if he can't find an answer. So I decide to go with this play. I also end up playing my Stitch, which is definitely a mistake. 
I should hold on to stitch in case I draw into a genie or big stitch to use the small stitch for ink since I'm only sitting on 5 ink. I also forgot to consider that if he plays grab your sword, he would get rid of my Maximus and a uh, free stitch and be able to trade his Jafar for my Hans. So holding on to the stitch here was definitely the best play. My opponent draws the queen, which is not too useful. I think his only play here is to play grab your sword and get rid of my Hans. He needs to ink also so he can set up for Elsa next turn. He inks the queen, though I think I would have preferred inking Maleficent or Small Tinkerbell. On my turn, I draw a Hades and I play it. And I have another decision of which card to recover from my banish pile. If I take a one ink card, I could play it this turn. But I know he's about to get to 8 ink, and there's a good chance he has an Elsa in his hand. I'm also at 17 lore, so I end up deciding to go for Hans. It's very difficult for him to get rid of Hans and Tinkerbell, since he would need 2 smashes. And I know he doesn't have one in hand. My opponent draws another queen. He inks her to play Elsa. Then he trades Jafar to get rid of Hades, which seems fine. He does have an extra turn with Jafar, so maybe he could have squeezed out two lore, just to avoid the embarrassment of getting 20 zeroed in the game. On my turn, I just play Hans and pass, asking my opponent the question, can he find a smash to survive one turn longer? My opponent gets another grab your swords. He needs to play Maleficent to try and find a smash. He draws into a friends on the other side, which gives him two more chances to draw a smash. He uses Elsa to sing it to conserve ink, which is definitely the right play and draws two more Maleficents which is pretty funny. Again, his only play left is to try and draw a smash off of one more Maleficent. And he goes and does this, but he doesn't find it. He plays his last Maleficent for fun and passes the turn to me. And I go ahead and quest with Hans to get to 20 lore. And finish the game bigling my opponent with a perfect score of 20-0. On to game two. We have a decent starting hand with uh, Lilo and turn two Flynn. Our only three drop creature in this deck is Cheshire Cat, so we could try and draw for him aggressively, or just keep a Hans and probably be our guest as Ink Fodder. I ended up keeping 4 cards, but I think tossing Hans out would have also been fine. Taking a look at our opponent's pre-mulligan hand, he at least has Prince Eric this time to hold off some early aggression. With his hand, I might keep Eric and the pocket watch as my first ink and dump the rest, although grab your sword is slightly tempting, even though it's a bit slow, and Ursula's Cauldron seems pretty nice to help the rest of your draws become more consistent. I'm not too experienced with the Cauldron, but it does look pretty decent at first glance. After some deliberating, it looks like my opponent went with Eric and Cauldron and dumped the rest of the cards. He draws into a much more solid starting hand than last game, so we should have a better match this time around. Smash and Rafiki are solid cards against aggro decks, 
Uh, big Tinkerbell becomes a pretty big threat to my deck, especially if he can draw into a small Tinkerbell early on. He decides on turn 1 to ink the Tinkerbell and play Captain Hook, which sets him up to drop the Cauldron on turn 2 most likely. But an alternate play would be to ink Captain Hook and pass the turn to see what I do. Depending on my play, he could play Cauldron or a defensive Prince Eric and still have the option of holding onto the Tinkerbell. Going second and seeing turn 1 Captain Hook is pretty annoying for me and definitely discourages me from wanting to play Lilo first turn, so I ended up going with Stitch turn 1, which I'm not sure is still correct. If my opponent had gone the turn 1 ink and pass route, playing Lilo first is a no-brainer for me. My opponent draws a Magic Mirror, which is not a good card in this matchup early on. I think he should just set up a cauldron and pass while keeping his Captain Hook readied to not die to Stitch. I think inking Prince Eric is fine here since he has Rafiki available for the next turn. But he ends up inking friends on the other side which I think I would have preferred to keep over Prince Eric. He plays his cauldron and activates it to set up a draw into Smash. Definitely want to get rid of the Ursula here as it's way too early in the game to draw her. On my turn, I quest and set up a Flynn after inking the Tinkerbell. I really like Mad Hatter in this matchup as 4 toughness avoids dying to cards like Rafiki, Smash, Captain Hooks, or Prince Eric challenges. So I'd like to hold on to him if possible. My opponent cauldrons a Maleficent to the top of his deck. Then Rafiki's to get rid of my Stitch and quests for one, which is fine. I draw a Hades on my turn and I quest with Flynn. I have a bit of an awkward turn 3, but I decide to just ink my Tinkerbell and play 2 Lilos and pass the turn. My opponent cauldrons a Mickey to the top of his deck. Then he gets rid of Flynn Rider with his Captain Hook discarding Magic Mirror. He plays Maleficent and inks the Mickey and passes the turn. On my turn, I draw a Genie, which is unfortunate as I would have really preferred an ink card for Hans. If I wanted to keep Mad Hatter, I could ink Hans and play Hades to grab a Stitch or Flynn. But I was too worried that he could play a grab your sword on his turn 5 and just wipe my entire board. So I decided to ink the Hatter and play Hans after questing. Uh, funny enough, my opponent actually does draw into a grab your sword. So I'm very glad I didn't play Hades last turn. He needs to stop the Lilo aggression here, but playing grab your sword won't get rid of Hans immediately. So I think he should just use Smash on Hans and get rid of the two Lilos with his Captain Hook and Maleficent, which is exactly what he ends up doing. I draw another Lilo, and I think the way to go is Hades grabbing a Hans. I ended up grabbing a Stitch to ink so that I could play the Lilo I just drew, but this runs into the same problem again of facing a grab your sword, 
which would wipe out my board. I played around that card last turn, so I'm not sure why I forgot and didn't this turn. My opponent has a pretty easy play this turn. I think he should just wipe out my side of the board with grab your sword, which he ends up doing after a cauldron activation and inking Tinkerbell. He quests and then passes back to me. On my turn, I draw a very lucky top deck of Mad Hatter, which I quickly play and pass my turn. My opponent cauldrons and puts up a beast up top, which will allow him to find a character that can get rid of my Mad Hatter eventually. And then he plays Elsa, quests, and finally passes the turn. On my turn, I get another very good draw, top decking Maximus, and I go ahead and play him in guard mode after questing to protect my Mad Hatter. My opponent cauldrons to put up a Jafar up top as he doesn't think he can survive long enough to use the Elsa. He plays the beast and decides to quest with his characters. Here he could have traded Rafiki and Maleficent for Maximus. I think either plays are pretty close and it's hard to say which one is better. For the third time in a row I have another good draw which is just an ink card, Cheshire Cat. So I can genie out his beast back to his hand quest for four, and threaten to win the game next turn unless he devotes some of his resources to get rid of my characters. I go ahead and play the genie, returning his beast to his hand, and this is a really big tempo play at a pretty critical point in the game. Seeing that I have enough lore to win next turn, my opponent's only play is to find the best way to get rid of my Maximus and Mad Hatter. He really needs to use a smash on Mad Hatter because committing two characters to challenge Mad Hatter and giving me two free cards is pretty bad. So the only choice he really has is to trade his Rafiki and Maleficent for the Maximus and then smash plus Elsa challenge the Mad Hatter. He finds this play, then he inks Jafar and passes his turn. I drew a Flynn off of Mad Hatter's ability on my opponent's turn, and then for my natural draw, I draw my second and last genie in the deck. For whatever reason, I played Flynn because it felt like a safe play, but considering that I should know he has a beast in his hand since I returned it earlier with the genie, the only way he can not lose on my next turn is by drawing an Ursula. There's literally no other way for him to prevent me to getting to 20 lore with two genies on board. So if I thought about it a bit longer, playing genie basically locks up the game for me. It doesn't really end up mattering as my opponent can't find any answer to Flynn regardless. 
So we go up 2-0 in the match thanks to some pretty lucky late game draws on my end. We ended up testing this matchup over 10 games, and the green-yellow deck went 8 wins, 2 losses against Purple Steel. The deck went a perfect 6-0 when going first, and went 2-2 two two when going second. On paper, the Purple Steel deck looks very solid with a lot of synergies. Like a typical control deck, it's focused on gaining a lot of card advantage to take control of the game, and eventually drop a big baddie like Elsa or Ursula and win the game off of out-resourcing the opponent. This is a typical control deck theme. Almost every card in the deck tries to gain some sort of card advantage. You've got Magic Mirrors, the Queen, and even Maleficent singing a Friends on the Other Side song has crazy synergy for card drawing mechanics. Rafiki is a great character that usually trades 2 for 1, eliminating a creature on the turn he comes into play, and then likely another one later on. You've got Grab Your Sword, which is great at getting two or three for ones in card advantage. You could find yourself with a bunch of Mickey and Broom recursions while getting rid of your trash cards with Tinkerbell draw and discards. But where this deck really falls short against the green-yellow matchup is tempo. No matter how many cards you draw, in the end, it won't matter if the opponent is always just one or two quests away from hitting 20 lore. Yes, Rafiki trades at 2 for 1 normally, but the two cards he traded for will have probably at least quested once each time. Black Mirror and the Queen are a limitless source of card drawing, but they require a lot of time and resources to set up, and can never really get going before the opponent wins the game. When you have a choice of drawing a card with the Queen or getting rid of a pesky Mad Hatter or Kuzco and your opponent is sitting on 15 lore, you're really never getting the card value out of her that you wish you had. And speaking of cards like Kuzco, this deck really struggles against 4 and 5 defense creatures. If the opponent lands a Stitch, Genie, Kuzco, or Mad Hatter, the Purple Steel deck really starts crumbling under the pressure. Even a 1-5 Rapunzel gaining 2 lore every turn becomes a big annoyance to deal with. Stick a Maximus in front of a high lore threat, and Purple Steel should be all but ready to throw in the towel. The control deck needs to make a choice between using its ink towards dealing with these guys inefficiently or drawing more cards. But if you draw cards, you're just going to lose the game in a couple turns. Finally, the deck also suffers from some consistency issues. It runs some very high non-inkable cards like Elsa and Ursula, and the deck overall runs 17 non-inkables or 28% non-inkables. I'm a firm believer in keeping the deck to at most 25% non-inkables, and ideally would even want to drop down as low as 20%. The green-yellow deck only has 14, or 23% non-inkables, and this keeps the deck draws extremely consistent. You're rarely going to find yourself in situations like this where you're ink-blocked sitting on high cards, just waiting for your opponent to win. The MVP in this matchup for Purple Steel seems to be Big Tinkerbell. It generally performed very competitively when it was able to get a turn 3 small Tinkerbell shifted into a turn 4 large Tinkerbell. The large Tinkerbell generated card advantage through board control, and if you add in a 4-5 body on top of that, you have an extremely strong answer to most of the cards green-yellow throws at you. The MVP for green-yellow was really hard to decide. All the cards are just so efficient and are huge threats once its lore count gets high. I think any creature with toughness 4 or greater is amazing in this matchup, and if you can get a turn 4 shifted stitch, it'll be extremely hard to lose the game. But the real MVP for Green Yellow is the coin flip. If you can go first and drop a turn 1 Lilo into a turn 2 Simba or Flynn, Purple Steel is going to have a very, very bad time. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching, guys. Feel free to leave a comment if you want to see any other matchups in the future.